Karl Marx, there are a few people in the world who have not yet heard or read of him. Marxism relentlessly attacks any enslavement of man by man. No wonder it incurs the irreconcilable hostility of those whose existence as exploiters is based on wage slavery. The esteem for Karl Marx grows among the masses even if anti-communists would like to destroy it. In a BBC News online poll in 1999, the BBC asked for the greatest thinkers of the millennium. By an overwhelming majority, Karl Marx took first place, ranking even ahead of Einstein, Newton and Darwin. In 2008, at the start of the most profound world economic and financial crisis in the history of capitalism, everybody was talking about Karl Marx again. In June 2013, even UNESCO felt compelled to honor his main works, the Communist Manifesto and Capital, as world documentary heritage in the memory of the world program. Such concessions do not mean general acceptance. Patronizingly, it is conceded that Marx made contributions to economics in the last century. His revolutionary conclusions, however, are opposed. But therein lies their very relevance. Marxism is today and in the future of decisive importance for the successful struggle of the international and revolutionary working class movement for the United Socialist States of the world. Based on six essential elements of Marxism, we would like to underline his current significance. Karl Marx was born on the 5th of May 1818 in Trier. His young days were a time of social upheaval. For centuries, church and nobility had ruled over and exploited poor bound peasants, craftsmen and merchants. Now the bourgeois revolution swept them away. In 1789, the French Revolution tolled the bell for feudalism in all of Europe. Already in the lab of feudalism, capitalist structures had started to develop. It was the advent of the steam engine on a large scale, Factories were built, steamships and trains opened up, new means of transportation. An industrial proletariat emerged and developed. The bourgeoisie reached the limits of the old feudal social order. Industry and science developed by leaps and bounds. They promoted materialist views and questioned the often religiously motivated and idealist God-givens. The time had come for a new thinking, feeling and acting. Full of compassion with the poverty and the squalor of the workers, utopian socialists, mainly in France, developed idealist notions. Incisively, they denounced the crimes of bourgeois society and dreamed of just distribution and equal living conditions for all. However, they only saw in the working class a helpless, suffering mass. Thus, they appealed to the capitalists to negotiate over reasonable, well-meaning concepts. In contrast to the utopians, Marx and Engels recognized in the working class the revolutionary force that had nothing to lose but their chains. 
but a world to win without exploitation and oppression. Like many young people of their time, looking for changes in the ossified societal relations, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels studied the works of the great German philosopher Hegel. In the Hegelian philosophy, they recognized his revolutionary contribution to the dialectical theory of evolution. All that exists deserves to perish. Herein precisely lies the revolutionary kernel of the Hegelian philosophy. There can be no finality, no fixed states of human thinking and action, but everything is in motion, in flux, in development. Thus, Willi Dickut, leading thinker and founding member of the MLPD, summarizes Hegel's groundbreaking merits. Hegel was an idealist and held that society develops according to the ideas of humans. Marx and Engels put Hegel's dialectic from its head on its feet by separating his significant advancement of dialectics from its idealist notions. By contrast, Marx and Engels took the view that every development is based on inherent laws. Reality is only mirrored in the consciousness of humans from which they develop their ideas. determines consciousness is the essential materialist notion underlying Marxism. Nature exists independently of any philosophy. It is the foundation upon which we human beings, ourselves the products of nature, have grown up. Nothing exists outside nature and man, and the higher being created by our religious fantasies are only the fantastic reflection of our own essence. In this materialist understanding, Marx and Engels saw the historical merit of the critique of religion, Ludwig Feuerbach. The problem of Feuerbach, according to Marx, was that he referred too much to nature and too little to politics. Addressed to Feuerbach, Marx writes, The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were universal scholars. They acquired immense knowledge in philosophy, mathematics, culture, history, natural sciences and military science. In old age, they still learned new languages. They were able to complement each other in intensive exchange on more specialized fields of knowledge. Lenin writes, The genius of Marx consists precisely in his having furnished answers to questions already raised by the foremost minds of mankind. The Marxist doctrine is the legitimate successor of the best that man produced in the 19th century, as represented by German philosophy, English political economy and French socialism. On the basis of dialectical and historical materialism, which incorporates the practical experiences of the struggles for liberation and the latest insights of societal and natural science, they developed socialism from a utopian dream into a science. With boundless energy and endurance, Karl Marx studied all scientific books accessible to him. He paid utmost attention to international struggles, gathering information about them. He spent weeks and months in the library of the British Museum. Important quotations and tables from books and essays he had to transcribe. There were no copying machines yet, let alone computers. Since 1844, he was bound in friendship with his comrade Frederick Engels, a friendship which would have fundamental importance for the whole workers' movement. Almost daily, either by letter or in long conversations, they exchanged views, informed each other and argued about the development of the international class struggle, about new books from the sciences and humanities, about conclusions for organizing the revolutionary struggle and so forth. Doubt everything is a motto of Marx. Not in the sense of skeptical challenging, but to put every finding to the test and confront it with the constantly changing reality. 
they were not timid about self-criticism. They had reckoned with a fast revolutionary development proceeding simultaneously in all capitalist countries. Without losing sight of the revolutionary perspective for even a moment, Frederick Engels later soberly observed, history has shown us to have been wrong. Marx and Engels proved already in their earliest writings the essential unity between humanity and nature. This is the basis for their scientific worldview. Humans are part of nature and can only live in unity and interdependence with it. In the course of history, humanity has learned to understand the laws of nature better and better and to utilize their effects, initially with agriculture and animal husbandry. Through labor, the interchange of matter between humans and nature is organized with ever greater knowledge and consciousness. This unity reached its hitherto highest level with the development of modern science and industrial production. In capitalism, the compulsion to maximize profits undermines the unity of humanity and nature. A worldwide environmental movement is forming against willful destruction and a threatening global environmental catastrophe. Spring 1875 in Germany, the unification of the then revolutionary SPD, the Social Democratic Party, with the General Association of German Workers, founded by Ferdinand Lasalle, was being prepared. For this, the so-called Gotha program was drawn up. Under the chief responsibility of Wilhelm Liebknecht, core elements of the revolutionary Marxist positions, which until then had shaped the program of the SPD, were renounced. Marx and Engels were in exile in London and only got hold of the paper shortly before the Unification Congress. They were outraged. In core issues, reformist content had been adopted from the Lasallians. Marx wrote a sharp and principled polemic with his paper, Critique of the Gotha Programme. The very first sentence attacked a core of the encroaching bourgeois ideology according to which labor is the source of all wealth. Labor is not the source of all wealth. Nature is just as much the source of use values, and it is surely of such that material wealth consists as labor, which itself is only the manifestation of a force of nature, human labor power. But the leadership of the old SPD suppressed this critique and hid it from the party members. Sixteen years later, long after Marx's death, Frederick Engels finally compelled its publication. By falsely claiming that labor is the sole source of wealth, in practice the merciless exploitation of humans and nature is de facto justified. The thesis of labor as sole source of all wealth also became a basis of reformism within the working class movement. With that, the ecological struggle is set against the social struggle and division is fueled between the environmental and the working class movements. The fundamental attitude towards nature and its protection is made clear by Karl Marx in Capital. Even a whole society, a nation or even all simultaneously existing societies taken together are not the owners of the globe. They are only its possessors its usufructuaries and, like Bonipatres familias, that is, good fathers of the family, they must hand it down to succeeding generations in an improved condition. This statement by Marx is one of the positions that have been pushed aside most in the working class movement. If it is not thoroughly embraced, humanity will not be able to stop the dangerous development towards a global environmental catastrophe. In 2008, the deepest, longest and most comprehensive world economic and financial crisis to date in the 200-year history of capitalism broke out. Unlike the bourgeois economists, the MLPD was not surprised. 
Meanwhile, it has gotten quite around the overblown slogan of crisis-free capitalism. Rather, crisis management is called for everywhere. What a pathetic admission of bourgeois economics. The long-maintained Marx critique collapsed miserably. The general validity of the Marxist crisis theory was practically reaffirmed once more. Economic crises will occur as long as the capitalist mode of production exists. The critique of the political economy of capitalism is the heart of Marx's doctrine. His main work is Capital. To recognize the essence of capitalist exploitation through this analysis, for countless millions of workers around the globe, this becomes a guideline and incentive in the struggle for their social liberation. Humans have always wrested things from nature for use as food, tools or clothing and produced them ever more perfectly. They learn to produce more use values than are directly needed by the community and began bartering with other groups. To the extent items are produced for exchange, they become commodities. In capitalism, commodity production has reached its highest level. The means of production, machinery and tools needed to manufacture them are owned by the capitalists. The necessity for the destitute proletariat to sell its labor power to the capitalist for wages is the basis of capitalist exploitation. Wage labor not only estranges the workers from his product, but also from nature. Cornerstone of the political economy of Marxism is the theory of surplus value. The labor power of humans becomes itself a surplus value creating commodity, as it can produce more than is needed for sustaining life. Jobs in capitalism have two aspects. On the one hand, they enable exploiting human labor power for the production of surplus value. On the other hand, they are the foundation of life for the workers. If the exploiting capitalist is called employer and the exploited worker is called employee, then this is a deliberate perversion of the fact. As if the capitalists create jobs out of their sheer charity. The flip side of exploitation is mass unemployment. Workers not needed as commodity for surplus value production constitute the industrial reserve army. Marx recognized that capital can only exist if it grows whatever the cost. If the growth reverts, crises of overproduction occur. However, capital can only grow if the number of workers producing surplus value grows. As capitalists continuously increase the exploitation of labor power, to eliminate competition, workers are replaced with machines. This leads to a tendency of the rate of profit to fall, the cause of overproduction crises. The competition among capitalists for the highest realizable profit forces them to constantly increase labor productivity and increase the sum of unpaid surplus labor. No capitalist can declare he is content with less profit. If he does, he has already lost. Against this law of crisis, the capitalists are powerless. Marx writes. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. The reorganization of international capitalist production also made an international industrial proletariat emerge. It is most closely connected with the modern industrial facilities and is able to be the vanguard of the worldwide struggle for liberation and assume the leadership of the struggle for the international revolution. 
the potential of a revolutionary world crisis unfolds again. Against this stands a tremendous power, solely ruling international finance capital. The 500 biggest industrial, banking and agricultural monopolies dominate the world economy nowadays and put their political stamp on the world. In 2012, they accounted for 42% of the world's social product, 70% of world exports and 90% of world capital export. They know no scruples when plundering humankind and nature. They will never give up their power freely. They are supported by governments from imperialist and capitalist countries and arm massive police and military organizations. They throw their intelligence services web of spying and surveillance over friend and foe. Not least, they have an all-pervasive media organization which engages in sophisticated manipulation of the masses mode of thinking. But it is a colossus on clay feet. The whole imperialist world system exists only in a general crisis proneness. Who wants to abolish capitalist crises has to abolish capitalism and build socialism. Just as capitalism grew in the lab of feudalism, the material preparation of socialism ripens already in capitalist society. On this basis, Marx developed the scientifically founded vision of a communist society in which the exploitation of man by man is overcome. In their probably most famous writing, The Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels uncover the role of class struggle in history behind the surging social conflicts. Not divine omnipotence or great men are the driving force of human history. It is the antagonism between slave owners and slaves, feudal landowners and serfs, nobility and rising bourgeoisie, and finally working class and capital. In consequence, this struggle of the classes is about the control of the socially produced wealth and political rule. The class struggle is waged as economic, political and ideological struggle. In capitalism, the class struggle proceeds in various stages up to its highest form, the revolutionary overthrow of the dictatorship of the monopoly capitalists and the building of socialism. The Communist Manifesto was rapidly circulated after its publication and translated into nearly all languages. Its closing lines electrify. The Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Mantra-like, anti-communists repeat that socialism, communism, cannot work. Human beings are too selfish. Laziness and apathy will spread if no exploiter is there to crack the whip. This might conform to their image of humanity and their mode of thinking. Capitalism and its supporters create and spread selfishness and malice. The working class and the broad masses will never accept this as image of humanity. Again and again, they have proven that they are able to struggle in solidarity, selflessly and heroically, to help give birth to a new era. That is the sole reason why humanity has developed at all through history. In the first socialist country of the world, the Soviet Union, a new society was built successfully from 1917 until 1956. A backward, dirt poor country developed into a modern industrialized country with far-reaching measures for environmental protection 
and especially with well-educated, proud people. All this against bitter inner and outer enemies, wars of intervention and the brutal aggression of Hitlerite fascism. After the victory over fascism achieved by a world-spanning anti-fascist alliance in which the Socialist Soviet Union bore the biggest share, a third of humankind was able to free itself from capitalist exploitation and oppression under the banner of Marxism. Socialist China carved out breathtaking advances after the victory of the revolution in 1949 till Mao Zedong's death in 1976. In the GDR too, after the end of World War II, there were hopeful beginnings for the building of a socialist society. As in every struggle of the new against the old, the revolutionary movement also experienced setbacks and severe defeats. The most severe devastation was caused by the modern revisionists' betrayal of socialism in the first socialist countries. Starting from the 20th Party Congress of the CPSU in 1956, Marxism-Leninism was replaced by a bourgeois ideology. Capitalism was restored in the form of a bureaucratic, state-monopoly capitalism, first in the Soviet Union, then in the GDR, and eventually also in China. This was not easy to see through. In the GDR, Marx was put on a pedestal. His texts were dogmatically repeated until they were only empty phrases, contrasting more and more with the experience of a leadership in party, state and economy that craved for bourgeois privileges and treated the masses with contempt, distrust and spying, up to building of the wall and severe suppression of any democratic aspirations. This situation fostered modern anti-communism more than the reactionary anti-communism of Hitler, Adenauer and others. Class struggle has to be continued also in socialism, a conclusion drawn particularly by Mao Zedong. The dictatorship of the proletariat is vital for that. The MLPD writes in its program Socialism is a society of transition from capitalism to communism. In order to achieve its communist aims, the working class organizes class struggle under socialism by means of the dictatorship of the proletariat and practices proletarian internationalism. The class struggle of the working class must be related to the control of the mode of thinking of the responsible leaders of the economy, the state and the party. This expresses from the beginning the essence of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Systematic ideological political struggle for socialist consciousness to overcome bourgeois ideology in unity with the socialist transformation of the economic base of society and the social way of living. Uncertainty and fragmentation of the revolutionary movement are the consequence of this betrayal of socialism. But this is not where it ends. Based on Marxist theories, revolutionaries and Marxist-Leninists have analyzed the root causes of the defeats, founded new parties, conferred and united their struggles. So the theories of Marx live on. When analyzing the historical development of humanity, Marx and Engels intensively considered the role of women and the family and defined the twofold conception of production. The social institutions under which men of a definite historical epoch and of a definite country live are conditioned by both kinds of production, by the stage of development of labor on the one hand and of the family on the other. They revealed that the special exploitation and oppression of the masses of women is inherent in the capitalist system and that the social liberation of the working class and women's liberation are indivisibly linked. Based on the bourgeois state and family system, the private responsibility for the individual family is the indispensable complement to the exploitation of wage labor in capitalism's socialized commodity production. Till today, women do the lion's share of unpaid household and family work. They not only bring children into the world, 
but provide for them, take care of the household and also sick and elderly family members. For that they are fobbed off with lower wages. But not only proletarian women are subjected to the consequences of the bourgeois state and family system. Petty bourgeois and bourgeois women also are kept in financial dependency, are specially oppressed openly or subtly. By uncovering these correlations, Marx and Engels laid the foundation for the indivisible unity of the struggle for social liberation with the liberation from the exploitation of labor power and the struggle for women's liberation. Marx wrote to Kugelmann in 1868. Anybody who knows anything of history knows that great social changes are impossible without the feminine ferment. Social progress can be measured exactly by the social position of the fair sex, the ugly ones included. Disunited, the workers are nothing. United, they are everything. Marx was not only a theorist, he was also a hands-on organizer of the working class. In 1847 he joined the Communist League, on whose behalf he wrote, together with Engels, the Communist Manifesto. Though capitalism was still in its infancy, they recognized that it had developed from the start as an international social system and so gives rise to the proletariat worldwide. Hence. The essential character of the proletarian revolution is, as Marx writes, a revolution which means the emancipation of their own class all over the world, which is as universal as capital rule and wage slavery. Marx and Engels spoke out against national differences and antagonisms between peoples. They were fervent internationalists. The Communist Manifesto states The working men have no country. We cannot take from them what they have not got. In 1864, the first international was founded in London under Marx's decisive influence. Organizing this union practically, clearing away obstacles, proposing resolutions and solidarity campaigns, Karl Marx proved to be the soul of this first international organization for the preparation of an international revolution. Karl Marx's role in the first international is described by his comrade, the worker Friedrich Lessner. Marx always attached particular importance to meetings and talks with workers. He sought the company of those who spoke frankly to him and spared him flattery. He considered it highly important to hear their opinion of the movement. He was always ready to discuss the most important political and economic problems with them. During the time of the International, he never missed a sitting of the General Council. After the sittings, Marx and most of us members of the Council generally went to a decent public house for a glass of beer and a chat. The practical collaboration with revolutionaries of different origins and characters went hand in hand with fundamental ideological debates. In the first international, only Marx and Engels were steadfast Marxists in all respects. There was an intense dispute with anarchism as advocated by the Russian revolutionary Bakunin. Anarchism was a petty bourgeois current in the working class movement. It followed the spontaneous rage of the working masses over the impoverishment that accompanied industrialization without understanding its causes. Modern anarchists make out of this a concept for a revolution here and now. Destroy what destroys you, often resulting in futile individual terror. Rejection of any binding organization, till today, this is the trademark of anarchism and anti-authoritarianism. However, the concentrated and highly organized power of capital can only be counted by the working class with a unified organization. 
In 1871, many proponents of the first international stood on the barricades of the Paris Commune for a first time workers' rule. Marx had warned of a premature onslaught, but once the battle started, his whole solidarity belonged to the heaven stormers. The Commune was defeated in a joint campaign of the French and German reactionaries, originally wartime enemies. Now and then the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real fruit of their battles lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. In his writing, The Civil War in France, Marx drew profound conclusions from the beacon lit by the Paris Commune. They included the urgent appeal to advance the organization of the working class in trade unions, but especially also in revolutionary parties. The first international had fulfilled its purpose for the time being and was dissolved in 1876 in favor of building national parties. Marx was an intrepid professional revolutionary. The funds he and his wife could raise from inheritances and modest earnings from journalistic work often did not suffice for long to cover the family's expenses. Engels earned money in the factory, inherited from his father, so that Marx could concentrate on his work. The doors of the often more than humble homes of the Marx family were open to political refugees and visitors from all over the world. Close friendships linked them with scientists, artists and writers like Heinrich Heine. Marx fully embraced life, appreciated and knew Homer, Dante and Goethe and revered the great playwright Shakespeare. Doubtlessly, the life of the Marx family was often difficult and full of sacrifice. Four out of seven children died very early due to the miserable conditions in exile. Little minds weave from this the legend that Marx left his wife and children in squalor while he entrenched himself behind his desk. Marx's wife, Jenny, too was a revolutionary, emancipated person through and through. She worked as his secretary out of false conviction, transcribing his manuscripts, which were hardly decipherable for others. His children, Marx adored with heartfelt joy. The three daughters, Jenny, Laura and Eleanor grew up to be educated, politically dedicated women. All their life, they remained associated with the revolutionary working class movement as translators and journalists. Eleanor Marx Aveling wrote about the relationship of her parents after their death. I sometimes think they were held together by a bond, almost as strong as their dedication to the cause of the workers their inexhaustible, indefatigable humor, the pleasure they took in jokes and witticisms. There's not likely to be two more like them soon. Despite all the sufferings and struggles, they were a cheerful couple, and the embittered thunder guard is a figment of bourgeois imagination. It will not appear strange to those who devote themselves to the study of human nature that the man who was such a fighter at the same time could be the most gentle and sensitive of all people. They will understand that he could hate with such bitterness only because he was capable of such deep love. On March 14, 1883, Karl Marx passed away at the age of 64. Frederick Engels spoke at his grave. He summarized the pioneering insights of his friend. In conclusion, He touched upon Marx's contacts with friends and political enemies and outlined his whole way of thinking and living, which to this day has an unabated charismatic appeal. And consequently, Marx was the best hated and most calumniated man of his time. Governments, both absolute and republican, deported him from their territories. Bourgeois, whether conservative or ultra-democratic, vied with another in heaping slanders upon him. All this he brushed aside 
as though it were a co-web, ignoring it, answering only when extreme necessity compelled him. And he died beloved, revered and mourned by millions of revolutionary fellow workers, from the mines of Siberia to California, in all parts of Europe and America. And I make bold to say that though he may have had many opponents, he had hardly one personal enemy. His name will endure through the ages, and so also will his work.